thanks uh, for uh, for coming. Uh, the uh, because of the structure and the fact this is streaming, I'll stand up here, even though my natural pension would be just to you know circle up and we have a brief conversation about uh, the topic. Um, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I run something called Open Invention Network, which is the largest patent non-aggression community in the history of technology, inside open source, outside open source. Um, and the reason why it's so successful is because organizations that manage projects like Linux Foundation have become uh, very dynamic and professional managers of, uh, of content producing entities in the open source world. And so we live in the slipstream of Linux Foundation, Apache, um, Eclipse, and a number of other project management organizations, and in the sub-projects that they represent. Uh, and part of what we are focused on is bringing together the most uh, important technologies that are the core of Linux and open source, things that everybody needs to standardize on, wants to standardize on, wants to build on, that's fundamental, that is going to form the backbone of, of a number of different uh, technologies uh, and products that are actually sold that are open source enabled. So we basically honor companies uh, around the world um, to contribute nominations that then can be used to increase the scope of the cross license. OIN is a very, very unusual entity. There's no analog in the history of technology or the law um, that is quite like it. Um, it fits the environment, though. Um, 16 years ago, IBM, uh, Red Hat, Novell, Sony, NEC, and Philips got together and they decided that what they wanted to do was create a deterrent to bad behavior from operating companies uh, like Microsoft, uh, which at the time was positioning itself as a monolithic threat. Monolithic threats in this game are very useful because they get people to coalesce in fear uh, to be able to work uh, to, uh, to thwart the efforts of, uh, of that threat. And so uh, what, uh, what I've done uh, during that time is to uh, manage relationships and recognize that the collaborative nature of open source is so powerful. It's a social movement. It happens to produce technology, but it's much bigger than and just the idea of, uh, of people coming together and, and creating technology. Um, and so this, that social movement, the modality that supports it, is what I'm really here to protect and what we've done for the last 16 years. Uh, we have 3,600 companies um, that, uh, that have gotten together from some of the largest companies in the world. Um, uh, Google is a funding member um, when they uh, developed uh, the, uh, the platforms that support uh, mobile uh, devices um, and their computing platform, Chrome and, and Android, those activities kind of put them in a position where they said they wanted to have a leading role in doing this, uh, in supporting this idea of patent non-aggression in the core of open source and Linux. Um, and so... Uh, we have about 3,400 packages right now that come from uh, hundreds of projects, literally, um, that allow us to kind of form this and increase the scope of the cross-license. It started out with 1,100 packages that were mainly drawn from the Linux kernel. And over time, we've expanded out from Linux to adjacent open source technologies. We even, uh, most recent uh, addition to the, to the cross-license zone, we added uh, Hadoop, and Hadoop is somewhat agnostic to what it runs on. It doesn't have to run on open source. It does in most cases, but it doesn't have to. And so we're looking at just open source technologies that are incredibly important. I mean, obviously, technologies like Kubernetes have been included for a while. Um, we have uh, uh, code that comes from Automotive grade Linux code that comes from all of the five networking projects the Linux Foundation manages, code that comes from non uh, Linux Foundation projects like the uh, uh, Jonathan's project who runs uh, OpenStack or what was OpenStack, the project formerly known as OpenStack. And so um, we have well over 100 packages that just come from that project itself. And so the whole idea is to uh, have a regular dialogue with the community, 
one to bring people in so that they commit that if they have patents that read on this fundamental core functionality within the open source community that we put into what we call this Linux system definition, which is the scope of the cross license, that they uh, will participate in the cross license and 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 put everything that they have that relates to that, that reads on that functionality into the cross license and they will agree that uh, they give as good as they get. Everybody else is in there and if they have patents that read on this functionality, they cross license each other uh, and they'll forbear litigation on those, on the claims in those patents, on those particular patents. And so um, the idea is it, born of, comp of co opetition which is what Jim during the keynote is really talking about without putting that name on it, but co-opetition is the whole idea that we're, that companies come together that are competitors and where we collaborate, we don't sue each other. Uh, everywhere else, you know, the normal rules around intellectual property. If you want to have patents, you can have patents. We don't care. Uh, we just want to neutralize the risk that's represented by the patents that are most important to code that people want to freely uh, uh, use uh, and, uh, and enhance. Um, and so we're supporting that modality that I talked about of collaborative development, building on each other's ideas, uh, growing uh, technology through collaborative activities, and getting this, this sense of a distilled uh, collective intelligence that comes from the open source community. And one of the, the things that I'm really particularly proud of is we started out uh, having mostly American companies, then we had some Japanese companies. Um, but now we have 24% of our participation is from uh, Asia uh, and 35% is from uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa uh, and the balance is from North America uh, and Latin America. And so we have a very good diversity. Uh, this is all about uh, creating an inclusive community. That's what makes this work is the more large companies, the companies that have lots of patents that are in there, the better. And then all of the, we have 500, 480 companies that are uh, very large with significant patent portfolios, above 200 patents. Some of them, as many as 86,000 patents, like Canon, which is one of the largest patent holding companies in the world. That's part of our community. And get everybody to believe in the same, that same basic norm. Collaboration is important, whether it's on the technology side or on the legal side, to make sure that this thing can grow. Um, and there weren't going to be any, any bottlenecks that were created to continue development and the uh, innovation occurring through projects, which is really what, when I look at this, I look at it's project-based innovation. Jim doesn't necessarily use that language, you know, to Mike Dolan or anybody else using that language, but it works for me because that's what it is. We've developed an alternative way of creating uh, technology, breaking down the barriers of and the inefficiencies of siloed development, company by company development, and being concerned about every every conversation that we had. I often think back to um, you're in a, you know, uh, it would probably have been a Greek diner at the time, but in the 1970s in uh, New York City, if someone from IBM came in and they looked back at the in the restaurant, and they saw someone from from HP, they would probably turn around and leave not risking any contamination or concern because the concerns around competition uh, law and uh, and the possibility, the appearance of impropriety through through discussion even uh, with a, a competitor uh, would be uh, you know incredibly concerning. The, the, the level of concern about antitrust in companies to this day like IBM is, uh, is acute. Um, and so uh, that's, that was then. Now, CEOs, COOs, people who think they run companies have no idea who's talking to whom. Um, and that's why, you know, also Jim's comment, uh, which I don't necessarily completely agree with, this techno, uh, uh, kind of a uh, techno-nationalism. Um, I think we've jumped the shark so that we, I, my first career was as a diplomat, so my perspective is a bit different. Um, I was in Tokyo, I've been at the UN in New York and France. Um, and when I look at open source, I see it as this elegantly seditionist uh, 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 and uncontrollable social movement that allows people, encourages people to talk to each other and to co-develop irrespective of what government wants. I mean, you pretty much have to shut networks down uh, and prevent people from traveling to try to squelch uh, the 
the, the virulent social uh, effect of open source. And so that's a great thing because we transcend uh, the control elements of the different forms of government that try to, but don't really understand how social movements like this that produce technology uh, evolve. And so I see that the point of techno-nationalism that Jim's trying to make, but that's not really what's going on, I think. And, and so we're in the business of ensuring that there are no subluxations. And so China has been, uh, I think I've traveled 64 times to China over the last 15 years. Uh, so I am there for a month at a time sometimes. Uh, the, the importance to me was of bringing China into this community uh, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, eight years ago even. Um, the level of participation um, of Chinese companies in communities like ours, but more importantly in, in major projects, was quite limited. Um, you had Huawei, and then uh, you didn't have many other companies. Baidu, Ali, and Tencent kind of all came into the community in a big way five to six years ago. Um, and I think that was, you know, 360 and all the other companies, uh, BYD, and then there, there are hundreds of companies literally from China that have joined OAM. It's the most significant growth area for us by design in the last, uh, last five to seven years, uh, even though I've been visiting uh, China, you know, since the early part of that period. Um, you know, that, that's been a significant kind of win as to how we kind of create an environment. Um, we look at emerging technology areas, the nominal sub, you know, subject of, the, of this uh, talk is, is uh, another topic that, that Jim brought up, which I think for, for him, you know, is top of mind, very important and during COVID. We've seen multiple examples of, uh, uh, of hacking of, uh, of major networks, corporate as well as uh, government, um, and the whole notion of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, um, if you, you look at areas that are increasingly becoming open source specific or open source centric, um, and then you look at the patent history in those areas, uh, it's usually a bad combination because people want to come in and they want to do more with open source in a, in a particular technology arena. You know, and it's hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of uh, uh, damage is caused a year, trillions of dollars literally have been spent to be able to, uh, over the last five years, I think it's a trillion dollars, uh, to be able to counteract the effects of, uh, uh, of, of cybersecurity breaches. Uh, and so um, it's this constant, you know, the, the sophistication um, of nationally backed or individual um, uh, uh, commercially motivated uh, hacks on systems uh, is increasing, which means that the countermeasures need to, to increase, and so that means more spend. Uh, and fortunately, there are more open source solutions that are being developed. I think there are 60 platforms, if we can call them platforms, I guess, listed on, on GitHub, um, and there are more and more all the time. But what, from a patent standpoint, what it is is, is a opportunity for non-practicing entities and practicing entities, um, practicing entities that are not winning, that, that see themselves as, as not being able to compete effectively in the market, uh, either through price, performance, quality, service, whatever the you know, critical elements are of differentiation. And those companies end up getting involved in uh, the use of their patents because that's all they have left. Um, there are many companies that uh, kind of live in a, with a sense of, uh, out of a sense of depravity or act out of a sense of depravity. Uh, and utilize their patents to try and slow the stall, the progress of, of any particular technology kind of uh, um, discontinuity like open source represents. And so we see this is the environment. And so every time there's a, you know, the auto sector, it's the, the networking sector, uh, we see what happens, you know, with, when open source en enters this space. It's how do we protect the ability of companies to make good choices about what technologies they want to implement to be able to deal with the, the new reality of, uh, of uh, uh, cyber attacks. Um, and they, you know, if you can work together, you can bring people together to be able to collaborate, you're going to be able to produce a better solution, a more elegant solution to deal with these situations and combat the 
the rising sophistication of uh, uh, of cyber um, uh, uh, of people who are involved in uh, in penetrating networks, um, and so we look at it. We look at this. What's the maturity level? Well, there's no history within cybersecurity of cross licensing. In electronics and you look at telecom, IT, networking, um, very sophisticated. These people deal with litigation every week, every month. Uh, a company like uh, that's one of our members, uh, um, Sony, I think they've had some years where they've had over 200 uh, patent litigations that they've had to deal with. Um, so it's they're among the top 10 companies that have ever been involved in litigation in the last 15 years. And so they live this, they know it, they're very sophisticated, they have outside counsel um, on retainer, some of the best litigation counsel in the world. It's a, it's just a, it doesn't get in the way of them running their business. They deal with it in a discreet way, they settle, they do a variety of things, they participate, Sony actually participates in more patent litigation, patent non-aggression communities that are maybe sister organizations to OIN as well as funding OIN. Uh, than any other company in history um, because they deal with these things. Companies that are in cybersecurity don't have that sophistication. They're on the other end of the spectrum. And so we go to these companies and try and work with them to understand, make sense of the situation that they find them in. Because one of the, 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 the weapons and levers of capitulation is to, the, is to trigger the collapse of sense making, kind of to, to get you to a point inside a company where everything stops because you've been sued or you've been asserted against, which is a pre-litigation uh, mechanism to try and scare you into settling and licensing. And so, um, I mean, it's not that all licensing is bad. There's lots of licensing that is very collaborative and, and encourages the sharing of technology um, that someone maybe has some legal right to. Um, I think there are lots of excesses in, 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 in licensing, but be that as it may, if there's a, you know, it's become a tool, and there's billions of dollars of capital that are, that go into just the non-practicing entity business. Um, you know, you've got uh, companies like FinGen Holdings is one of the larger holders of. Uh, they've aggregated through many different iterations over time. They were once a public company, and now they did take private a couple of years ago, or you know, last year. They were bought by one of the largest patent hold patent aggression companies in the world. Um, and so Fortress is the owner. Interestingly, they're owned by, uh, by the uh, um, Japanese slash Korean SoftBank group. Um, and uh, they are uh, in a business that seems highly inconsistent with, with Arm, which is another one of their holdings. Uh, but they're pretty much purely a financially motivated operating company that holds many different businesses. Uh, they're a hold large holding company. Um, and they just happen to own two entities that are uh, that are that make money. One through the sale of, of designs, products, services. The other is uh, is essentially one of the largest trolls in the world. Um, and so now you have all of these cybersecurity patents and lots of other technologies uh, uh, that are uh, patented uh, inside Fortress. Fortress has something like six billion dollars that is invested in intellectual property. Um, that's formidable. Um, and uh, they have been buying up entities like this. FinGen was a, um, a, uh, a practicing entity for many years. Uh, and it was developing technology, providing solutions, um, selling products. Um, but then it got to a point where it was no longer viable. This is not an unusual pattern, and they the value in the company really was in the business model was shifted to licensing, and so uh, they became the uh, kind of a one of the the modern antagonists to cybersecurity. You had a number of different companies, Symantec, Checkpoint, and a dozen plus others that had been uh, that had been sued by them. Uh, sued by FinGen, uh, and then you have corporates, and so Cup Cup uh, Cybersecurity is a subsidiary of a European company called Cup, which C U P P, which is a 
an operating company, but is looking to supplement it, what it develops on the product side and services with, uh, with revenue um, and from uh, licensing and litigation. And so these, this is just early days, but you can expect that more and more, as more and more money is put in, there'll be more litigation. And so we look at, at the, the risk profile. We try to include from open source projects code that people are going to be utilizing to create uh, 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 their cybersecurity uh, systems and uh, to be able to thwart attacks and anticipate. And uh, we include that in this scope of the cross license. So anybody who's in the community is agreeing to cross license each other. So it's neutralizing the risk that, from, that comes from operating companies. What we do against non-practicing entities and what we'll do in this space, as we've done it in every other, other, every other technology space, is that we look to uh, uh, work with companies that are at risk or in litigation by mobilizing our network within the open source community to identify prior art, and analyzing patents, understanding their weaknesses, whether they're not novel, whether they should have never been, been granted. Uh, and then we take the, um, the prior art and we share it with counsel, um, internal counsel, external counsel, uh, for the company that is, again, at risk or in litigation. And so this is a, a standardized, routinized process for us is to, to put together packages that help companies defend themselves more effectively. In some companies, we'll even, we have over 1,100 patents and applications. We will forward deploy those patents to companies that are at risk in, or in litigation if they're being uh, sued by an operating company. So we would have patents that read on, the op, on a number of operating companies that are potential antagonists. We then convey the patents to them to allow them to counterclaim because important to the difference between operating companies and non-practicing entities. Non-practicing entities don't have products, so you can't counterclaim. Uh, so you've lost an arrow in the quiver of defensive management of, of risk associated with patent litigation. Um, so you have to have other tools from the non-practicing entities. So we got together when Microsoft came into OIN, which was an important uh, a milestone um, two and a half, almost three years ago. We, um, I think, as a very in a very explicit way. Um, Microsoft uh, viewed us as a vehicle of uh, you know, sanctification, maybe too strong a word, but of their transformation into an entity that uh, um, was worthy of being part of the open source community. Uh, and those are not my words, they're their words to me. Um, and so OIN looks for opportunities to work together with Microsoft and other companies in the community to be able to do good things to reduce patent risk. And so one of the good things that Microsoft did as a result of them coming in and us forming this kind of partnership, if you will, and, and as part of their process of, of showing that they are uh, open source friendly and uh, comfortable uh, as a member of the community, uh, was to invest in, uh, this is significant money, uh, but we invested with IBM uh, Linux Foundation, which is a significant that kind of statement of leadership from uh, from Jim um, and uh, and Microsoft in founding and funding uh, the Open Source Zone, which is a something that Unified Patents maintains. It's a patent company that is a good guy company. They focus on attacking poor quality patents and getting them uh, to be uh, invalidated. And so, and there are thousands of poor quality patents out there, some percentage of which read on open source uh, functionality and, and products. And so uh, this entity, we fund uh, every year to be able to support this troll interdiction, the idea that you remove the, the, the gunpowder from the, from the weapons that, uh, that, pat that uh, patents represent for uh, uh, non-practicing entities. And so what we did is, uh, is fund that, and then uh, we get a report out every three months on their activities. Um, and they've, they've been successful with over, I think, 60 patents uh, that they've attacked and, and had invalidated that read on open source functionality that had either been used or were latent assets that were being prepared for use 
uh, to be able to attack uh, open source project code uh, uh, products, products that result from the adoption of open source project code. So it's a, there are many ways of dealing with, with risk. We just do these things um, and not because, I mean, Jim's other theme this morning, which is one that resonate, resonates well with me, is it's the notion of humility. We're not the stars of the show. We're just behind the scenes, in the trenches, one foot in front of the others. We're a grinder. Um, you know, it's the terms used in golf when you don't have a great day and you're just having to get around the course. You grind. Uh, you do whatever you can to score. And what we're trying to do is have a profound positive impact on the community, but one that's not about our ego or our identity or uh, any of the IBM doesn't care whether OIN's ever mentioned in the press, uh, even though they're kind of the chief architect of OIN's formation. They just want the effect that people have choice, that people can make good decisions and not be forced into making decisions about what technology they're going to use because someone is holding a patent knife to their throat. Uh, patents can be very powerful, uh, can be very beneficial to, uh, to innovation, but they can also have a detrimental effect on, on the ability of companies to make good choices about, the, about technologies and about whether they're going to be contributing in, in major projects, minor projects. Um, Jim highlighted 750 projects that they manage. Um, you know, many of those are, are, are ones that we embrace to include that technology, the core technology uh, that they produce to ensure there's freedom of action. And our goal is to, like when Toyota became a member of OIN, they invested $20 million. This is real money that people invest to support this, this whole model of patent non-aggression that we promulgate. Um, when they came in, it's, there was a very explicit understanding that my responsibility was to bring in as many auto companies as possible into the community or companies that own patents that read on, uh, on the auto, automobile sector. And so um, getting most of the 26 companies in China to join uh, was not trivial. Uh, and then getting almost every other uh, auto company in the world uh, to join uh, in the two or three years subsequent to them, them participating in funding OIN. And so it's, it's like that in every community. Right now, we're focused heavily on banking, financial services, uh, and, and card the card issuing companies and, uh, and crypto companies. I'm an advisor on COPA, which is something that's, it was Jack Dorsey's uh, view of, you know, he wanted something that, um, that would benefit the, the crypto community and reduce patent risk. And so he had something launched, uh, which was a little premature, but it, it was a statement. He had something launched earlier this year that focuses on a patent non-aggression pact between uh, in crypto companies. I mean, we protect some crypto technology. We have a number of crypto-related companies in our community, but you can do things that are that are that are uh, kind of a parallel universe or complementary to what OIN is. Patent risk mitigation is not kind of one-stop shopping. It, it's it's really a, a mosaic of multiple strategies and components that allow you to get to de-risk uh, yourself and your company and the products that you produce, the services you offer. Um, and so we, uh, we did this for the auto space because it was, you have, to, you have to push and you have to drive and, and we're bringing in banks now. We, we sign a new bank about every eight weeks, uh, um, a bank or a FinTech company. And so that community is coming because the more they rely, I mean, the banks have utilized open source uh, technology for well over a decade. It's just that the consciousness of that decision is actually something that's only occurred in the last three or four years. If you look at RECs um, of what banks are looking for when you look at technology, it's tra transformed dramatically. Um, they were like auto companies. They've fallen into the pattern of eating their food pre-chewed, um, which is not a, a flattering reference. And it's purposely designed not to be flattering because they were um, at least auto companies had a history. If you look at Daimler, Toyota's history, founding, these are technology, sophisticated technology companies um, that had fallen into a trap of having tier one suppliers tell them what they were going to put into each, each model. You know, and they literally Bosch and, 
and Denso and other companies come in with a book and they say, all right, this is your program for the LX whatever. And, and then you're going to, okay, well, we'd like to do this. We'd like to do that. And so there'd been a, been a, a real decline in kind of active participation and the roadmap development was largely done by a third party. That's changed a lot in the auto space. And Automotive Grid Linux has been, a, I think, a, a lubricant for that transformation to occur. And the same thing is happening to, to some extent with the banks now. I mean, I talk to banks and I tell them, you know, in five to seven years, you'll be taping out your own chips. And the, you know, a lot of people just can't get their mind around that, that, you know, this open source hardware thing. Well, that, that's going to affect us. You know? you know, we get chips from so-and-so. Well, that world's done. You know, it's 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 a fake company that this is going to change, and we're you know I'll talk a little bit about it, but we're also very concerned about taking the, the success that we've had on the software side and having it also appeal, apply on the hard on this on the hardware side. So we're our ambition is a big one, but it's within a confined space of freedom of choice, freedom to operate, and open source across the board. So. Banking, financial service is very important, and you know if you look at the SWIFT, SWIFT network is is where uh, back office transaction processing, a lot of activity occurs. Um, uh, it's like Swiss cheese. I mean, there's so many. I, I think it's double digit um, uh, intrusions that have occurred over the last five years in the SWIFT system, um, and so that's why you know uh, blockchain and hyperledger is an important component to be able to uh, develop solutions that uh, where we actually have uh, um, much more integrity in, in the transaction environment. Um, if you look at uh, five years ago, I had a conversation with, uh, with Daimler CTO, and he said, you know, we're going to use blockchain for all of our, all that smart cars that they own with Geely 50-50, uh, Geely owns Volvo, owns 15% of the shares of, uh, of of Daimler, the corporate entity as well. So uh, don't sleep on Geely. Uh, it's a very significant company. And they together are going to be using a smart platform to be able to do their autonomous driving program. Um, that smart car platform that we saw launched here probably 12 years ago. And so all of that work, all the every trip that they, those be, those autonomous vehicles take will be tracked in a, in a in a blockchain so that there'll be every every time a, a vehicle leaves a spot and then comes back to a spot it will be one one record that is uh, uh, inalterable that the regulator uh, which drives a lot of these decisions the regulator in Germany is going to be requiring and then in other parts of the world similarly so that there's a a good handle on exactly what's happened to the all these autonomous vehicles and so whether they use a, you know, whether it is a blockchain solution or it's an alternative solution that's more scalable than blockchain is for the number of iterations, the daily, daily tracking activities that would be required. The important thing is that technology is becoming much more central to the auto sector and much more central to the banking and financial services sector so that the, the hiring is very much, there are five times as many technologists in an average uh, money center bank as there were just five years ago. And it's been massive hiring and much more sophisticated and talented people than the, the people who typically were, were involved in influencing technology decisions historically. And so this is an arena that's, that's exploding uh, with, uh, with the notion of managing risk, of preventing cyber attacks that will then cost you know potentially billions of dollars um, and so these are the kind of arenas that we focus on and uh, where we look to to look at the technology that that these banks are d adopting uh, it's also insurance companies uh, you know Jim mentioned the, the power sector we're talking to many of the power companies in Europe as well as in North America about recognizing the rearchitecting of their networks and moving power back and forth I means a lot more facilitated because of the architecture, the inherent architecture of, of European systems versus American power grid. But nonetheless, both are looking at re-architecting their networks. It's a global trend. Uh, and all the companies that do city planning, urban planning, are clued into this. And so we work with them as well about understanding what the important technologies are going to be and what, 
what we need to essentially neutralize risk around because everybody wants choice in the core. Um, and so that's what we do. Um, and uh, everything we do is free, um, which is another interesting and un unusual component. Um, and so uh, we provide prior art free. We, we have counsel that uh, litigation counsel that for companies that don't have the ability to um, to actually defend themselves uh, in some cases will step in and bear the costs of their defense um, we do all this quietly uh, it's not about patting ourselves on the back or getting accolades or uh, props from anyone it's just doing what's necessary uh, and having a very sophisticated group of people and a very big budget um, just to give you an example, during the Microsoft, uh, we're a skirmisher. Um, we're not a big, you know, entity with billions of dollars. We have we use our money in a careful, and thoughtful way. But um, example of how we utilize what we do to attack poor quality applications. I talked about how we're dealing with poor quality patents by working with Unified Patents in partnership with IBM and Microsoft and Linux Foundation. What we're doing before a patent gets granted is there's something called a pre-issuance program under the American Vents Act. And what we do is uh, we monitor every week patent applications. We particularly have a, um, a set of companies that we're concerned about that are, um, I mean, many people, this isn't a secret, uh, and it shouldn't be a, a, a something that people are not familiar with as an idea, but like uh, like homelessness and criminality, um, there are many companies that are present in the building today and in events um, that are not open source centric. That are um, that it's like it's like a criminal wearing the cloak of homeless to perpetrate crime. There are lots of people who are. It's not hundreds of companies, but I think and think of many different arenas in technology where companies live on the outskirts of, of open source. They're not all in, although they have plenty of very authentic people that they employ. The corporate leadership, the identity, the business model are antagonistic to open source more than supportive. And uh, these are companies that when you, when they're going to be forced to change their business models. And I think, you know, I mentioned open source hardware. I think embedded companies are going to be, are in for a significant transformation. Um, because it's just not sustainable to be able to work ass backwards by saying, we designed this, here you can build your product around it. You're going to increasingly be building your product around something that you've designed and taped out and somebody produces chips for you. Um, and so, again, auto companies are there. They understand this. Banks, financial services companies will get there. Um, and so that dynamic, I think, is really interesting because, again, that's why my interest is so acute in open source hardware right now. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not done on the software side. 3,500, 3,600 companies is not that many. There should be 10,000 that are part of our community. Um, we've got 500 mega companies, and then the rest are companies that, that are uh, um, small to medium-sized companies that we hope will be you know, gigantic at some point, and they don't have to have a lot of patents um, in their growth. Uh, but uh, what we are doing, this is something, so we attack poor quality patents, as I was saying, or applications. And uh, so if somebody files an overly broad claim from a company that we're concerned about, uh, we'll identify prior art, feed it to the patent examiner before the patent gets granted so that they can reduce the claim scope dramatically to thereby neutralize the risk that the, that patent represents or they'll reject the patent application out of hand. At the same time, we, we use something called a fast track system to file ahead of where that idea came from. We look at that idea. I mean, they, you may have the priority date by filing a patent, but what we do is ensure that you can't grow a patent family. And so we file every possible extension from that base patent application, uh, and we utilize a fast track system, which is expensive, but again, it's necessary. And so we might file eight applications that are, that are around that general idea. So while they're trying to get, while the original filer is trying to deal with the patent examiner and get, get preserve their patent claims, we're ensuring that they can't grow a patent family. 
uh, which is where real danger comes from. Patent families are what people leverage. So individual patents are very rarely uh, um, the uh, uh, critical of the, the direction of a technology. So you have to make sure that you scorch the earth so that around that, that invention so that the idea cannot grow a, a supportive patent family over a course of usually two or three years. You see family development occur. And then when you've got six, 10, 12 patents that are around the core invention, that's where you have strength in terms of monetization and through litig and litigation. And so what we do is ensure that that can't occur. Um, and that's a, a, you know, we're one of the, probably the largest user of this, this feature uh, in, uh, in North America. Um, and so we're working in, in China, we're working in, in Europe to be able to utilize the tools that they, they allow us to, to use to be able to do similar things for granted patents and for pre-issuance. Um, another thing that we've just implemented, which we're about to announce, is that um, Intellectual Ventures is based here. It's one of the largest uh, patent holding companies in the world. They have multiple funds uh, that are filled with patents that read on different, different activities. Lots of old patents, which is good because that for them, not, not for the community. Uh, and they, they increasingly, they have lots of patents that have priority dates that are way back. They have patents on, you know, they claim to have patents that are highly relevant to Kubernetes, Docker, uh, uh, Kafka. So lots of things that are impossible to probably avoid at this point for most companies. And because of the, the widespread usage, uh, that gets their attention. And so they've started to assert uh, patents. Soundview Innovations is another entity that has patents in those same technologies or claims that they're in those same technologies and they're utilizing those patents to actually litigate. They filed, pat they filed patent loss of infringement lawsuits against a number of different financial institutions for the use of those technologies. Um, and, uh, and also Hadoop is, uh, is on that list uh, in terms of what Soundview has. And so in order to deal with a very large patent assertion entity, you can't just go after, you know, utilize Unified to attack individual patents. They just have too many patents. They have hundreds of patents that read on these technologies or claim to read on these technologies. So what you need to do is, is something that we're pioneering is the idea of syndication, where we go in with partner usually that has a strong relationship with a patent assertion entity. Thank you. And then what we end up doing is uh, negotiating uh, what we call a sliver license. Like they might want to license all of their patents. Uh, and that might be 10 million or 15 million or 20 million dollars to some company. Lots of companies can't afford that uh, and don't want to be held up in that way in terms of patent holdup. And so what we have done is negotiate a sliver license, which gives you um, all of the open source related patents um, that come to, you know, if you're, if we have the 400 plus companies that are really large companies, we go to them and we're going to be offering them the opportunity to license. The more companies that, that come in, the lower the, the ratable price is for the, for the participation. And uh, this is a pass through. We don't, we don't get any money for doing this. It's just something that we've developed. Since we can't be spending $50, $100 million, uh, $200 million on buying one, you know, one portfolio, uh, we want everybody else to be benefiting. Um, but to create an opportunity for them to pay a much lower price because they're only getting access to what that which they need to protect them from their open source use, usage. And so we do that. Uh, we'll be announcing that in a, in a few weeks. We're partnering with an entity called RPX uh, that has a very strong relationship with uh, IV. And, uh, and then uh, the bulk of our companies will get a free license because they'd never be targets of a, of a patent troll, troll through patent assertion entity kind of activity. Um, so they'd get a free license and the other companies would have to pay some amount based on how many participate. And so we're trying to be innovative and creative to be able to protect the open source community on the technologies that are important to it. Um, and uh, that's, you know, while well, cybersecurity is the topic, without the contextualization, it's hard to understand what we're doing in cybersecurity. But the more code we can put in that's in, from important projects, that's nominated by people in the community, um, the better 
the protection is, and then it's our job to do, as I described, the commitment that I made to uh, to, to Google around around Chrome and, and Android in terms of bringing lots of companies in that are users of that those technologies, and the same thing on the on the auto side to Toyota when they came in to make sure that we had as many uh, as many companies as possible, so that we're neutralizing the risk at all the auto for the entire auto sector because there are no companies that can hold out and sue on core Linux functionality from AGL or, or other projects that might uh, might be derivative of uh, uh, sources of technology for uh, the open source uh, adoption activities inside these industries. So um, I'm, you know, again, what we do is free. People participate as licensees for free, whether you're a gigantic company that has a ton of patents or a company that has no patents and maybe was just minted yesterday. The whole idea is that we have to provide uh, protection and defensive support and be a guardian uh, of open source and the modality and that I talked about at the outset. So if you have any questions now or questions later, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is a very personal kind of thing for me. Um, I travel a lot, even during COVID, maybe not as much, obviously, but uh, I'm constantly on the road 290 to 300 days a year during normal times. And uh, it's about trust and it's about confidence. We talked to some of the largest companies in the world and they have to be comfortable that we're gonna be a rational actor because highly unusual to have a license where the licensor can expand or change the scope of the license obligation um, at will. Uh, we, uh, we give people the opportunity to, uh, to opt out in the event that we were to act irrationally, but at the same time, uh, very few people ever do that because we are a rational actor and we've proven that over 15, 16 years of operations now. So as I said, it's a dialogue and it's, you know, I, there are many companies I talked to for over 10 years. Huawei signed the OAN license last year. I've been talking to them for 14 years. Um, it's, so it takes, sometimes it takes a while, but it's also the relevance as open source becomes more relevant, so too does OIN. Uh, because Jim made a decision 11 years ago, 12 years ago, that he wanted to be, he wanted to become a professional management organization of projects, not just to have Linux under the, under the tent. And what that meant in order to do this rapidly was to utilize permissive licenses like Apache, which have precious little um, deterrent effect in terms of uh, patents. I mean, there are some patent elements to it, so it's not to, to disregard those completely, but... OIN is really a purpose built to be a companion to patent management or to, to, to project management organizations and, and projects themselves to enable freedom of action, to give people comfort that they can utilize these technologies and make choices that are, uh, that are the best from their, for their technology roadmap and their, what they want to deliver their customers, not ones driven by uh, patent positions and control of third parties. So. Anyway, thanks for being here, and uh, welcome to uh, getting back to uh, to actually being able to have human contact again without a computer screen in the middle. <laughs>